The Bacosan Art School of Fine Craft near the Outer Banks of North Carolina is excited to announce that registration is open for their 2022 in-person workshops. Join them in their newly renovated studios for classes led by world-class instructors in metalsmithing, woodworking, ceramics, and mixed media. You can also join Pocosin Arts from your home by signing up for an interactive online workshop in a variety of media. Scholarships and assistantships are currently available, so to learn more about these opportunities, visit pocosinarts.org. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 403 of the podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in. Today on the show, we have the first in a series of three episodes that focus on parenting. For this series, I've asked friends of mine that I have gone to for advice about parenting to sit down with their partners and talk about the process of preparing, of the transitions that go on through having a child or sometimes multiple children and how that affected their ceramic practice. This first interview is with Jen Allen and Soji Satake, who are based in West Virginia. If you'd like to see examples of their work, you can go to their website. That's jenniferallenceramics.com and sojisatake.com. They have both been featured on this show before, so if you'd like to hear interviews of them talking about their career and their work, You can search back through the archive to find those. I believe Soji actually was one of the first people on the show. He was in the first season, probably episode four or five. And Jen has been on a couple times. So hope that you guys will search back and listen for those as well. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. Hey everybody, this is Jen Allen and I'm guest hosting this episode of Tales of the Red Clay Rambler. I'm here with my partner Shoji Sataki to talk about parenting and finding balance between work and life. We live in Morgantown, West Virginia and I work as a studio potter and Shoji works primarily as a ceramics professor at West Virginia University. Hey Shoji. Hi, everybody. Thanks to Ben Carter and the Tales of the Red Clay Rambler for allowing us to to be guest artists today and happy to do this. Awesome. Yeah, he had asked us if we would be willing to talk about our experience parenting. And I think this is a great topic that I know a lot of young artists are kind of struggling with and trying to find answers for. And although we by no means have any answers, we just wanted to kind of share our personal experience with our own kids. We have a six-year-old son named Finn and an eight-year-old daughter named Annalise. And we somehow have managed to keep our careers and also raise two kids. So some of the things that we wanted to kind of share about was kind of the transition that we experienced moving from, you know, no kids to having our first kid and what that was like. Shoji, can you speak a little bit about your thoughts on that topic? Well, I mean, I think for us, we've been together for a while and I don't think we ever planned, We I don't think we were 
plan to have kids or not have kids or when when would be the right time to have kids none of that stuff really kind of happened it just kind of organically happened right Jen like we didn't say like oh we're going to get married in two years we're going to have kids and you know we want this many kids and we didn't do any of that it just right like um when we started dating and we were together we were really kind of singly focused on our careers and um, our studio practice. And then, and then years later, we started having kids. And so, there, so for us, there was no like perfect timing. And so um, it just kind of organically morphed. And but I think one of the great things for us, in my opinion, for us, and not, this is not for everybody, but that uh, we had kids uh, later, Right, we're older parents uh, for than the typical, I guess, parents. I don't know what that means anymore, but um, we we were able to do a lot of things that a lot of younger parents aren't able to do, and so uh, because uh, we were relatively established in our careers, and we had we had a little bit of savings. We you know we owned a home, those kind of things. So I think it was in that way it kind of helped us get a little bit more grounded. Certainly when we had our first child, we still really didn't have a clue what we were doing. But. Yeah. I mean, I, I just remember being in the, in the hospital and asking the nurses to teach me how to change the diapers because I never was a babysitter growing up, um, especially not for little babies. You know, I might've babysat like an eight-year-old, but they're out of diapers and, you know, eating on their own and all that stuff. So learning how to do everything from day one was quite a challenge for, for me. Um, and I think also with our daughter, like she kind of surprised us by coming a couple of weeks early and I was in the middle of a big making session. Um, and so I had to, I mean, luckily I had a bunch of damp boxes that I was able to put my work into because, um, I didn't want all that you know, productivity to go to waste. So she came two weeks early and, and then, you know, talking about transitions from being, from not being a parent to being a parent, um, being a mother is very demanding. And especially if you, um, are looking to breastfeed your kids, Annalise, with Annalise, it was really discouraging because she wasn't the kind of kid that, um, took really quickly to breastfeeding. And so, I felt like something was wrong with me, you know, and went through some postpartum depression. And then I remember getting home with the baby for the first time when there wasn't help around, you know, telling us what to do and thinking, you know, what have we done? Like, this is crazy and I'm not prepared for this. And I freaked out a bit. I mean, but of course, this little, this little being was so special and so amazing that I didn't, you know, I didn't want to let her down. I mean, my number one job in life was to keep this little thing alive. And so I was just constantly, um, awake worrying. I did a lot of worrying because I was afraid of SIDS and all these other things. I mean, I'm a worrier anyways. Um, but I remember that the first two weeks with the first kid were the most challenging two weeks of my whole life. And I remember too, when the grad students at the time would say how sleep deprived they were, I would just kind of, you know, think to myself, oh, you have no idea what sleep deprivation is until you're a first time parent. So, yeah, I mean, as far as that adjustment it was, it was big. Um, and we don't have family nearby, like Shoji's parents are up in Alaska. My parents are in Oregon and we're in Morgantown, West Virginia. He has a sister. Shoji has a sister that lives in DC. I have a sister that lives in New York, but we didn't have anybody really close that we could count on to help us with the, with the kid. Um, my mom did come luckily and helped a little bit for, you know, a little less than a week when Annalise first came home. And that was um, a huge help. But yeah, I remember having discussions with some of my Potter friends too, before I had Annalise, like asking them, 
you know, if they had any tips or tricks on, you know, I, I was about to be a new mom and, you know, I have this career that's really booming right now. And, and what are some things that I could do? And I reached out to Carrie Radash and Molly Hatch and Elizabeth Robinson. And I asked them and one of the, or one of the consistent things that they all said was to just make a bunch of bisqueware because um, once your pieces were bisque, then you know you could go into the studio and in our case, the studio was a little 10 by 10 foot area of our basement. Um, so I could go down in the basement and I could glaze like one or two things if there was time while the baby was napping. And then I could go back up and take care of the baby and not have to worry about things getting too dry um, for me to continue making. And so that was a really big help hearing that. And, um, however, (laughs) you know, in my like rush of productivity two weeks before my due date, um, I ended up, you know, I was making a ton of work and then late that night in the middle of the night, my water broke. So, um, but luckily I had damp boxes, like I said, so I was able to put all my greenware into damp boxes And then, you know, two weeks later, a month later, when I was able to really get down to the studio again um, and spend a little bit of time here and there, I could put a handle on one thing um, or two things or, you know, and then um, go back up and, and take care of the baby. You know, the other thing that both Shoji and I had, right, Shoji, that was really um, beneficial in our lives was that you are a university professor and you kind of write your own schedule and you have, um, you're not gone nine to five Monday through Friday. Right. That was a good thing. Right. Like, um, because I'm the area head for the ceramics area, I get to, you know, one of the things I get to do is write the schedule for the faculty in our department. And so we were able to juggle things. And Jen was also teaching for us at that time. And in fact, she went back to work like after like two weeks, right? You went back to teaching. I did. It was really dumb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like we didn't take paternity leave or any of that stuff. And so like uh, she went back right back to work. And so then, so we were just, so I was, we, you know, we, we knew that going into that semester that that might happen. So we were able to, I was able to create a class schedule so that, you know, we weren't teaching at the same time so that one of us would always be home with our daughter. And um, and one of the other things that, you know, I was able to do was like, uh, is uh, because I travel quite a bit, well, po- pre-pandemic, I traveled quite a bit um, for work and to facilitate our China ceramics program in Jing Dajan. And so um, one of the things that I made a commitment to is after we started, we had our child, and we started the family was that I would be, I wouldn't be gone more than two weeks <clears throat> any given time after that. So, um, which meant that I made, I made a lot more frequent trips to China where before we had children, I would stay there for like six weeks at a time um, and then do less trips to uh, less trips. Yeah. But I wouldn't let you be gone that long <laughs> because I needed help. I was right. going crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's true. I only took like two, well, both of our kids were born at the end of January. So we had already started the spring semester teaching when they both came. So I had like, you know, a week or two of classes and then I had, then I, you know, had the baby and I had to leave for a a little bit. Um, And then I came back, but I mean, looking back on it now, I mean, I know so many moms do the same thing because they aren't given maternity leave. And, you know, as an adjunct faculty, I didn't have any maternity leave, right? I wasn't given that. And so, and I also felt bad relying on grad students to, you know, cover my classes while I was gone. So I really wanted to get back into the studio and teach my students because I also felt I was doing them a disservice not being there. And so I did kind of jump right back into teaching both times, both after my daughter and after my son. And looking back on it now, I think that at the time, I think I made the right decision at the time. And, but you, you really like a mother needs time for her body to heal. And, 
everybody's healing process is different. And so, uh, I really would, you know, go with whatever your doctor recommends. If you do have to go back to work, you know, talk to your doctor about that. So, yeah, but I mean, I guess in those kind of things are lucky because of what we do for a living. And, you know, Jen is primarily a studio artist and because my te- the, the way that my teaching load works is that <clears throat> it's pretty, it's flexible. I, you know, like neither of us have a nine to five job. And so that did help in terms of like what we were doing about daycare and those kind of things, and especially with no family around in the area. So, but also realizing that, you know, that it doesn't matter who you are, right? I mean, it's really difficult to balance things like parenthood and anything else you do, like whether you're an artist or you have any other career. So, Do you remember our daycare experience and how that, how that went and what kind of challenges we had getting, even getting into a daycare? We live in a pretty small college town, right? It was like very competitive trying to get onto even a wait list, right, Jen? Mm-hmm. <laughs> if, like if we, we couldn't, like, even though like the university provided like, you know, a daycare a service for faculty and staff, we couldn't even get in because there was like a two year wait list to get in. And so by that. Yeah. You have to like, the moment you're thinking about having a baby is when you <laughs> yeah. need to contact daycares. Yeah. <laughs> And then, so we, you know, we were very lucky, right? Because of our next door neighbors, they used to run a daycare and uh, they had retired and they were happened to be watching their great grandson and great daughter that were the same age as our kids. And so we were able to like, they were willing to take our kids and, you know, they, they made an exception for us. And so we were able to just walk them across the driveway next door, which was, you know, I mean, I don't know how that happened, but that just was like an amazing circumstance and coincidence, like, right? It's just a happenstance that that just happened. So we were pretty lucky. And then, you know, and then the kids, we still have a relationship with them. And, you know, they adore our kids like they would, they were just one of their great grandkids. And like our kids love them like they were, they're, you know, grandparents. So, but those things cost money too, right? And then those kind of things. And, um, even trying to find like Jen, remember, like even finding like babysitters, right? Like we find these really great babysitters and stuff, and then they would graduate, right? Because they were students at the university, and then or they they, they would move away because they were getting married. You know, we had one that we loved so much and the kids loved so much, and she happened to be dating one of our students. And then after uh, she graduated, they were planning to move away and get married so we even thought about ways to like break them up so she could stay and be our babysitter <laughs> right I mean, we were serious about um, it but we did talk yeah <laughs> right. so yeah so even things like that i mean we live in a very mobile town where you know our a lot of times like our our best dog sitters and our best uh babysitters are usually our students that you know that we have a relationship with but then you know that they, you know, they time out and then they go off to pursue other things. And, you know, and we encourage them to leave Morgantown and, and seek other adventures. And many of our grad students have seen our kids grow up, not just, not just from the fact that they see them all the time, but the fact that they were our babysitters for our kids and stuff like that. Yeah, for better or for worse, yeah. No. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, but, but it really means, right, like, it just you just have to kind of make things work, right? Yeah. And we shared the, I mean, we were, we're the primary caregivers and we shared the responsibilities of caring for our kids, but, but primarily because our schedules were flexible, right? Like when I, when you were working, I would watch the kids and when you were off, you know, I could, you know, work in the studio and you'd watch the kids. And, and so we were lucky that we were able to kind of um, move back and forth that way, because, you know, let's be real, you know, Uh, daycare is super expensive. And for the first two years of both Annalise and Finn's lives, we didn't have them in a traditional daycare. We had a babysitter that lived next door and she wasn't able to watch them all the time. And in fact, she hurt her back and had to stop watching them for a while. And we still had, you know, the benefit of being able to kind of 
to kind of shift and adjust. And I think that's the biggest thing about parenting is just like, you're constantly having to be ready to make a change based on the situation, like the kid gets sick or the kid gets hurt or, you know, something happens with daycare. And especially now with the pandemic, you know, with parents dealing with the virus and kids having to go on quarantine. And so having to like shift, do a 180 at any moment to be able to, you know, care and provide for your children. It's, it's, uh, yeah, I think one of the biggest learning lessons for me was to be able to do that, especially, you know, because before kids, I was such a planner and I would stick to goals. Now I just kind of go with the flow. Um, I feel like I've changed a lot as a person since I've had um, my kids. Yeah. Well, don't you think though, you've also become, I know I have, because I was never that much of a planner, right? Like I always would kind of went with the flow and didn't change all the time. What? And then, well, I mean, like my, like, you know, all the things that were always changing, like my exp- travel experiences, like China, and like we're always having to like be fluid and like decision making is what's going on. Sure. But I've also learned since we've had kids that I've had to learn to become more disciplined about making time because you can't, you can't do it all. Right. And because there's so much going on. Yeah, even if you want to, you can't do it all. Yeah. You know, like the perfect example is like uh, when Finn, our youngest, was what, five months old, you know, we we went off to do the uh, the visiting artist residency at the Archie Ray Foundation. Oh, yeah, that's right. He was like three months old. Yeah. Three months old. Yeah. And so we decided that, you know, Oh, that we were going to make them part of our family and we weren't going to be adjust really adjusting as much to their needs more so f- that they would become well, that we would try to do things as family so we would travel with them or they would travel with us and um and so we went did this thing up in the bray and right and then but because we also brought our dogs we couldn't stay we couldn't stay in the chicken coop as part of the residency mm-hmm. so we had to rent the place off off campus and then you would go during the day, come back, and we would have dinner together as a family. And then I would do a night shift, right, and pull the graveyard shift at the break. And, that, you know, that was one way that we made it work for both of us, right? Or, or you would go and do, like, you know, a residency at Red Lodge one year, and I was staying home. And then, then the next year, I would go do a residency at Red Lodge, and you would stay home. So we've made sacrifices, right? So, like, uh, before the kids, but we've also tried to adjust where the kids are part of our lives. And, you know, until the pandemic hit, like, I think our kids went to like every NCC, uh, the every year, except for the year that they were born. Right. Yeah. Well, even Finn went the year he was born. He was like, Oh, that's right. All oh, right. 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 Yeah. I got pictures of people holding them in the hotel room. Yeah. Like, like by the time we had the second one, there was like all those things we were so freaked out about with our first one, just kind of went out, you know, out the window with the bathwater, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, like, so I mean, it was, a, it was just the fact that the experience of having one before, like, really kind of, ch- you know, changed the knowledge of our how we behave as parents, I guess. Yeah, totally. And that poor second kid also doesn't have as many photos or videos, like every minute of doing something cute. Um, yeah. Poor second kid. <laughs> you know, I think the one thing I've learned also is that, you know, I think having artists, parents or people that, you know, are, aren't engaged in the arts, maybe for me, I just think that um, it's easier for me, maybe perhaps see the world through our kids perspective, right. Because of that general creativity that we have as artists. I don't know if that's true for everyone, but and because I think maybe a lot of times, even in my own work, I admire like some of that, you know, that untainted, like innocence that the kids have. And even the way that not only do they be, not only the way that they make art, but even their approach to people and problems, right. That we can't do as adults anymore. Like, you know, so like, I, you know, I love that quality that I see in our kids. And, and I, you know, I think I was, you know, as an artist, I'm always trying to gain some of that in my own work. Yeah, true. That and their, their energy level. Like if I could bottle that up, it'd be amazing. 
and and the older the kids well who was i talking to i think it was aaron Ferensky. she's she said to me i was i was like gosh aaron this is parenting is so tough with the you know with annalise and she's like jen i hate to tell you things things never really get easier they just get different and i thought that was so so true and now having kids that are older you know they're out of diapers now they can buckle themselves into their car seats you know all those little things that you kind of take for granted really does make it make a difference but then there's new challenges that come up like with our kids now it's a lot about coordinating their sports schedules cuz they both are big into hockey and um well hockey mainly and then tennis also and um swimming in the summertime and so just kind of juggling all that and you know dealing with them just becoming or growing into their skin a little bit more and um becoming more you know their personalities are starting to come through and everything they do and you know learning how to adjust to you know their moods and all that kind of stuff you know right now it's around the holiday season and we celebrate christmas and just thinking about how how much longer you know santa's going to be a topic in our house and so you know those kinds of things are difficult difficulties that we're facing facing now don't you think since we are like we had kids later than the average parent i guess yeah i i mean i'm noticing w- with a lot of our sports yeah like the parents that of the kids that are our kids age a lot of them are younger than us by maybe 10 years but there are still some that are the same age but i'd say the percentage yeah were um not the typical age you know to have kids i guess but i don't really know what that means like for instance i had annalise when i was 37 and i had finn when i was 39 and anything after 35 now they're calling a geriatric pregnancy so they kind of monitor you a little bit closer because you're um an older mom um but yeah i mean i guess you know having more time to build up a career and become more mature as a person before having a kid certainly has its advantages but i also think that there's certain disadvantages too and so i mean i just don't think there's any right time to have a baby yeah i don't know what else i'm saying have to say about that but now that our kids are a little older how much has like your studio practice shifted again or has it changed from when we started having kids yeah it's definitely changed a lot so with annalise the first kid I would try to get in the studio when I could, uh, but I already had kind of a, an established body of work that I was just kind of working on fine tuning a little bit. I was making wheel thrown porcelain pieces and what I decided to do with her was kind of create more of a monochromatic palette. So I lost a lot of the color in the work and that helped me kind of focus more on developing texture and things like that which I was really interested in. And then when Finn came along, um our babysitter was unable to watch him for a while and so I had to really figure out a way to stay creative because if I don't have studio time, I am not a happy person. I am not nice to be around. I am not a good mom and I'm not a good wife. And so I need to have that creative studio time in order for me to be happy. And so what I did with him is I just started making ceramic jewelry. Um this was 6 years ago I started that endeavor and it really allowed me to bring the studio up to the kitchen table uh and so I could, you know, I'd have time to work on that at the same time I could watch him, you know. Um and it wasn't like a big thing to walk away from and if something dried out or didn't work out it wasn't as big of a time commitment so i really did take a break from making a lot of pots and kind of um, changed the way i worked and added jewelry into the mix and started making more jewelry i also didn't teach as much you know like i 
instead of teaching two classes a semester, I shifted down to one class a semester. And that also uh, kind of helped me give me more studio time anyway. Shoji, how did your studio practice shift since we've had kids? I mean, it shifted a little bit. Like, you know, I, my, my primary focus through most of the year is teaching, right? And trying to make work. And so I always had to kind of find that niche time to make work, right? Like whether it was trying to overload in the summer, during the summer or during the short few weeks we had during the winter breaks or working at night when the students were in the studio or, you know, especially like on a Friday, Saturday night, because I, um, you know, I do a lot of work at school at the university and then, or in my studio in China. And then, and then it, through that process, like, you know, um, if I needed to get work done, I really needed to, especially um, if I was working on projects in China, I needed to really outsource, right? Like I really needed a group. Of, we needed, I needed a team of people to help me. And so I have these really reliable friends, um, you know, or journeymen craftsmen, like these uh, master craftsmen and stuff that I work with in China that have become like dear friends of mine who have become part of my team in the type of work that I'm making in China. And um, so that when I do go over, when I was going over, like everything would be laid out for me and set up in my studio so I could just work during the time I was there. Or, um, if we were working on projects together that um, I was you know, I could relay the information and, uh, and work remotely. So this idea of like, you know, so I'm used to working remotely, like, you know, this idea of like Zoom chats and Zoom correspondence and stuff wasn't that new to me that we, you know, I have been doing a lot of that with my colleagues and friends and partners and team members in China. But that's in many ways, I guess, like uh, the students, the students, they give me a lot of practice, right? Being, te being a teacher about like dealing with our own kids um, and vice versa. That's true. Like I learned a lot from my kids that now then I apply some of those experiences with my students. And, and part of the thing that I've learned is like, you know, like um, one of the things that the, the kids have taught me um, in my teaching also, and even the way that I look at my studio practices, um, is about time, this idea of time, and uh, and the not only the time it takes to make something, but you know the time it takes to plan something, the time to th conceive of these ideas, and also the fact that you know that even the even in my what I see also like you know if you give my kids time, right, like uh, they will they will like impress like they will meet those challenges you test into the creativity that comes to that fosters their ideas. And, um, and then like, you know, that they, if you're patient enough and you, and then you work with them and you cultivate this experience with them, like they gain a lot from that. And then that through that process, like you'll be very surprised with all the things that they will impress you with. And like, I see that a lot, you know, I think in many ways, that's applied also to like my teaching and my studio practice. And so um, I'd be more patient, which, um, you know, um, I've had to learn to do. And, uh, and uh, you know, my kids may say different, right? Because when they, whenever like I get grumpy, like I'm very vocal. So, yeah. but yeah. So yeah, it's, you know, the, the way that I think about it is like, you know, it's like we aren't the first people to be doing this. Like the first artists, parents, artists, couple that had kids. Um, so and other people, you know, thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of other people, you know, the history of, of the history of our, you know, our careers, the kind of likeness that we have in terms of like the people doing this kind of stuff have existed and they've managed to do these things as well. Right. So. You know, like even though our problems are very unique to us, that a lot of the things that we're confronted this, with is pretty universal. That you know that that we that we try, and I try to stay focused. You know, the things will work out, right? And um, 
and then but it never you know i don't know about you jim but it also never like works out the way you think it's gonna work out right it just kind of works out that's an understatement for sure we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors this episode of the podcast is sponsored by amico brent For the past 100 years, Amico Brent has been creating ceramic supplies for our community, ranging from underglazes to electric kilns, and they have no plans of slowing down. With over 3,000 products, Amico Brent's top priority is making sure that all of their customer needs are met. From the professional to the student and everyone in between, their high-quality materials enable you to make your best work. To learn more, check them out at amico.com or on Instagram and Facebook at Amico Brent. You can also show them how you use Amico by sharing your work online with the hashtag HowIAmico. Today's episode is brought to you by the Rosenfeld Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. The collection exists as an online resource for research and inspiration featuring photos of thousands of objects made by over 800 artists. The images are high quality and can be used with no permission required, making them a great resource for students and teachers. To find out more, visit RosenfieldCollection.com. What do you think? Like, do you think our kids are actually interested in what we do as artists or as teachers? (laughs) You know, like, I don't see them like, Our kids definitely aren't the kind of kids that come in and want to make, you know, make work with us side by side with us. I mean, even even given studio time, like they'll come into my studio and I'll, you know, plop them down, put some clay in front of them and they lose interest, you know, within, I don't know, sometimes 20 minutes. Like it's not they don't have a a long extent. uh, They don't have a long attention span for playing with clay in the studio they do like drawing um finn is definitely more i think finn is definitely more interested in the arts than annalise right now i think annalise is mostly interested in video games and sports (laughs) Um, which i wish we could change a little bit the video game part but uh that's a, a current challenge we're facing Um, But Finn, I mean, Finn is way more of a, he's really good at role playing by himself. He loves coloring and he loves um, playing outside and practicing, you know, playing hockey all the time. And so he really is more, I think, self-motivated in that way um, and has more of a passion for things at least that's obvious right now where um, Annalise is a little more protected, I think, in, in um, the things that she likes and her emotions, you know? And so it is interesting though, how, how different your two kids can be, you know, don't you think it's like, it amazes me that they're, they have such opposing personalities. Um, Like, I definitely think there's traits in them that you start seeing that relate to the parents and, and how kind of interesting and silly that is knowing that, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, they're not wanting to go to school with us really, or, (laughs) I mean, it is funny that Annalise wants, she's like, she's like, mom, you're famous, right? Cause she saw like the number of Instagram followers I had or something like that. And I'm like, honey, I'm not famous, but that's cute of you to (laughs) to think that it's like, maybe I'm, my name is recognizable in the ceramics community, but that's such a small portion of everybody. It's not like I'm, you know, somebody that she could relate to like Justin Bieber. It's not like I'm a Justin Bieber (laughs) or something. So I think that that's, that was kind of cute. Um, but I mean, just coming with us to all those in Sikas and meeting all of our ceramic friends. I mean, I feel like they have this really wide community that they've become aware of and gotten to know that, uh, it's really good for them. Yeah. I mean, like, I think the, 
only reason now that they wouldn't be coming to things like that with us is because of school. they can't miss that much school anymore. Right. Yeah, that's true. I mean, this was all while they were still in daycare and it wasn't like they were missing school. I think the one year that we had, we took Annalise to the Minnesota and Sika conference. We had, she had to write a big report on her time there and, you know, that related to every subject she was studying. So there was like a math component and a social studies component and a a writing component and a reading component. And she had to meet all these markers to get that time excused. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, it's more of a challenge for us to manage that. I know this year we were talking about, I was going to stay home and not um, go to Ensika so that I could watch the kids. But now all that's up in the air because I think I am going to Ensika unless the Omicron variant like shuts down the world again. You know, also like having the dogs before we had kids kind of also prepared us about thinking about other people besides ourselves. Yeah, a little bit, right, because we always had to find somebody to watch the dogs when we had to leave, right? One thing that I've had a fun time kind of doing as a parent and kind of building up is is creating a library of things for my kids to read or look at um, and learn from. And I'm wondering if you, Shoji, have any, like, favorite books or objects or anything that you've given the kids or that we've given the kids or that the kids have acquired from elsewhere that you think is like really good for as a parenting tool. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, like the same thing as you said, like a lot of things that we also try to introduce them, like, you know, they, they may have a fascination or be really into it for like, you know, a couple of days and then kind of just then becomes like old news, right? Like, um, some of like the musical instruments and stuff that we picked up and them to play with and just kind of mess around. Like, unless I think like, you know, I think the only reason like, for example, like Annalise has any interest in that, those kind of things now is because, you know, she uh, started doing like pop shop, like the school of rock thing. And so she's thinking about how she sings and those kind of things where she is getting some formal instructions now, formal guidance. Right. But, but it's really, you know, the idea is like really kind of important to, for me, I think it's like investing in like their interests and in introducing the various different things so that there's, you know, they hopefully will pick up some of those things as, as things that they're interested in. I mean, they're even the reason that, you know, that we got them playing hockey was, you know, we were trying to find them like physical activities in our town for them to do. And then we, when I started looking at like, you know, the, the, the different opportunities and the seasons that they can play in, we realized that for ironically, like one of hockey was one of the more affordable things that they could do almost year round, right? Because of the way that the, the, our local club works and all the fundraising that we do and, and then all the grants we get and, and then it's being supported by the Pittsburgh Penguins Foundation and the Sydney Crosby Foundation. For the those of us artists who are not sports fanatics, it's the it's the national it's the professional hockey league in our area that really underwrites a lot of youth hockey programs in our region, and so it makes it really affordable for them to play, right? Because like you know one of the things like, for example, for like hockey is like it's too expensive and it's too rough, and are the two things that most parents will say, but 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 because of the way that it's structured here, it's neither of those things. And so, and then the fact that they've fallen in love with it, they really like doing it with their friends that they've made, you know, is a, you know, if they want to continue to do it, yeah, you know, we'll continue to support them to do it, but we won't force them to do it. You know, my, my attitude has always been that they can quit as soon as they're not, they're not having fun anymore. So. You always, you're constantly trying to figure out like financially raising a kid is, is tough. And so how can you, how can you um, introduce them to different things where you're not spending a fortune on it? Like taking them to the library versus, you know, buying them books, Um, uh, taking them, you know, to the, the public pool instead of, you know, buying a 
uh, indoor pool pass for the year or whatever, you know, like things like that. And for me, you know, I grew up, my, my mom was a, a tennis coach and she coached and still coaches tennis and has for like 40 years. Um, but it was one thing that I could do with them outside on the public courts in town, you know, that wasn't that much of an expense. And, and like Shoji said, you know, we'll support them as long as they are happy and like doing it. And as soon as they don't, you know, then we're happy to let them do what, what interests them. But I was thinking about, I have purchased some books for the kids and um, some of the books that I really like, I found this series of books called a kid's book about, um, and they're all different topics. So it's this, um, publisher in I think Portland, Oregon that makes these books. And so I've gotten them a kid's book about money, a kid's book about racism, a kid's book about bullying. So like all these big topics that, um, I don't even know how to quite approach talking about. Um, but these books kind of have helped give me an insight and they, you know, in reading them to the kids, it kind of helps open up this conversation that might be, um, a difficult one to approach otherwise. And so I, I really love and highly recommend these series of books and perhaps they are available in your, at your local library. All the ones that I've gotten, I've really enjoyed. I'm trying to think about other things that we've acquired that were really helpful. I know like, what about when they were little babies? Like one of my favorite things was that, um, that chair, what was that thing called? It was, a it was like a Norwegian company. What is that chair called? I'm going to look it up, but there are also those, um, oh, it was a baby Bjorn. That's what it was. And it was this little like sling chair. That's kind of like, it's like self motion chair. So the baby would just move and it would like gently bounce and you could strap it in. The nicest part about it is you could take the whole fabric part of the chair off the metal structure and throw it in the wash and clean it. And I think that that was always a struggle was trying to keep things clean that the babies are in. Um, The other thing Annalise had really bad like indigestion as a kid. And we had to go, we went through like three bibs a day. And so our laundry practice really kind of ramped up, which was crazy. But one thing, another thing that I really liked was I, I wore both of the kids on me during the day. So, um, we had that, it was also baby Bjorn, I think one of those, is that what it was called? Yeah, I think so. I think it came all from that that same company. And there was another one too that I really liked um, that somebody had gotten us. Yeah, baby, I'm looking it up right now. Sorry. Yeah, the baby Bjorn um, baby carrier. But there was another company that made organic cotton ones that was really nice. And uh, I'll I'll look it up. I think it was Ergo Baby maybe. That sounds like it was, yeah, Ergo Baby. That was the other carrier that I really liked. Anyways, um, what other things when they were teeny tiny do you think were really helpful? Oh, I mean, like, you know, just keeping the cardboard boxes and stuff because they like playing in those things, right? (laughs) Like, you know, like rather than like the stuff that, you know, the Amazon was shipping inside those things, they liked actually the box they came in. That's true. They were way more interested in the boxes than the, than the toys, the toys they lose interest in so quickly. And I think because, you know, quite honestly, you don't have to be imaginative when you're using the toys, the toys kind of create this specific thing for them to do, but a cardboard box, you know, you got to use your imagination to play with a cardboard box. And that's, um, I think really helpful for a baby and they love it. So Yeah. I can't really think of other things. I mean, there's so many other, there's so many things now that I'm like, oh my gosh, that's really cool. Or, you know, this is really cool. But, um, I do remember, however, that the tinier, the kid, the more stuff you have to travel with and the bigger, the stuff you travel with, you know, you got your playpen, you've got your 
high chair. You've got like all of this stuff and they all make like travel high chairs or, you know, the car seat or, you know, all those things. It's just crazy how much, how much stuff that they need or that you think that they need, I guess, too. I don't think everybody travels like that, but we certainly, or at least I was an overpacker. But I think we're, um, well, I mean, we're coming up close to an hour maybe of mm-hmm. of chatting. So I feel like we should probably wrap wrap this up. I mean, we've got kids coming home from school shortly. So we got to, uh, you know, figure out dinner and whatever the evening activities are. I think there's hockey tonight. It's Monday. No, it's Christmas break. So they don't finally don't have it. Oh, but they have it tomorrow. They have, yeah, they have it tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. So any, any last uh, words of wisdom you have? You know, we jokingly talked about having six kids, right? But, <laughs> you know, like, but that was before we had two kids. So that was before we had one kid. Yeah. yeah. And I never was a part of that conversation. That was all you. <laughs> Well, you know, I thought having a jazz band would be like a family jazz band or like a basketball team with one substitute would be pretty cool. But, but after, you know, but after having kids, um, even one or two, that the reality really kind of sets in, right? But, you know, I'm glad. I mean, for us, I'm really glad we have two kids. And part of it has to do, especially even more like during this living through this pandemic, just the fact that, you know, when we were being isolated and quarantining last year, they had, and then they're so close in age, most of the time they're best friends. And so they are playing with each other. And, you know, even though they're very different people that, uh, you know, that, that they've been able to like kind of play and, you know, engage each other. And so it helped us, right. Help them, I guess, and vice versa. They play really well together and they also fight really well together. Yeah. But yeah, especially, you know, like when we had to isolate and we really couldn't, you know, hang out with anybody else. And then also, and I think about when, you know, even when we're gone, they'll have each other. So, you know, th- those are kind of things that I think about. Um, for us, it was, it worked out. You know, for most part, they're pretty cool kids. <laughs> Not all the time, but most of the time. Most of the time. It, it's it's fun to be engaged with them. And, I, and I'm lucky. And I know you're lucky too, Jen, in the way that we can spend as much time as we can with our kids. And, um, because of our careers and the way that we raise them. And, you know, my attitude and my goal is like, you know, I'd rather smother them now. So, you know, when they are old, when they are young adults, that they when they actually move out of the house, They'll actually move out of the house forever and not, and not keep coming home. Uh-huh. Like we did, right? Yeah, like we did, right? Yeah. God knows my parents took me back in so many times. <laughs> so, yeah. I was just going to say, I feel lucky to be able to be a parent. And I do love, you know, 99.9% of it and struggle with the other 0.01%. But um, it has all been a a real joy um, in the end. You know, I mean, there's, you know, I mean, it, it isn't always pleasant, right? But, you know, if you have the good and the bad, it's, you know, it's like it's pretty darn cool and pretty darn good. And, and when it isn't, you know, like always threaten them to like send them back to their home planet that we adopted them from. And, you know, like, and like, because they're not really human beings, they come from this other alien planet. They're all named Chucks. You're going to pay for so much therapy. <laughs> yeah. older. Yeah. So, but, uh, but they know. They know. They, yeah, they know that dad is crazy and just joking around with them. There's no such planet like named Knobloch and <laughs> where people are all named Chuck. Oh, my goodness. On that note, I think this is a great place to wrap things up. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to contact me. You know, you can contact me through my website. It's jenniferallenceramics.com. And also through Instagram at Jen Allen Ceramics. And Shoji, do you have any contact information you want to put out there? 
Yeah, you can um, contact me through various different social media stuff. Um, probably the easiest is through my Instagram, right? Which is just my full name, Shoji Sataki, S H O J I S A T A K E. But I do have a website, it's just shojisataki.com. Or you can just contact me through the university at WBU, West Virginia University Ceramics. I just Google search that and, and then all my contact info should pop up. Well, thanks again, Ben, for letting us um, be co-hosts today. And thank you all for listening to the show. Yep. Thanks a lot, man. Happy New Year. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all indigenous communities whose lands we reside on in the United States and recognize that we are uninvited guests on the occupied, unceded, and ancestral lands of over 500 nations indigenous to North America. By acknowledging and reflecting upon the contemporary lived experiences and histories of the indigenous peoples here and globally, we may begin to take essential steps towards creating a more equitable world. Learn more through the hashtag Honor Native Land Initiative of the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture and consider contributing to Indigenous-led organizations doing important work to further health and wellness, sovereignty, and self-determination of the first people of the lands you reside. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.